All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Art and Science of Coaching on the Under the Sun podcast. I'm your host, Coach Tim Hall, and I am, as usual, partnered up with Coach Zach Gregg. Today's topic is a big one, one that uh, one of us is very good at and excited about, and one who has an interest in it, but... uh, not all, not not that good at it, but uh, we're going to talk about time trialing, the fundamentals of time trialing, and uh, and what it takes to be a top performer in time trialing, and just all the nuts and bolts from start to finish. Uh, and there's no one better, I think, than talking to you, Coach Zach Gregg. You've uh, you are somewhat of a time trial extraordinaire nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, no, it's it's definitely a discipline that somehow I've I've become super attached to, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting because it's it's so far removed from tactic and and strategy that you assume you know happens with road racing, and it, it's just totally its own thing. So, yeah, I I really enjoy time trialing, even uh even though I'm in an area that's not necessarily like the best for time trialing, you know, you you think it long flat roads and things like that but um no it's it's super fun and and i think it's probably the most accessible uh cycling discipline that's a good point accessibility and yeah we're gonna we're gonna fill some gaps in here for a lot of people who either are new to the sport of bicycle racing or bicycle riding or have been in at it been at it for a while and just have never done time trials because maybe in their head they think I'm not good at it, so I shouldn't do it, but I'm here to tell you as a coach and as a promoter that uh, you can be good at it and how that working on it and performing at it will help you be a bicycle, a better bicycle racer and rider in general in all spectrums. Uh, And I I love that word accessibility. You're right. It's just like mountain biking, Uh, how, how time trialing can introduce someone to the sport in a safe, healthy manner. And, uh, and so we're going to share our thoughts about uh, how can you uh, get into it? How can you perform at it? How, you, how can you excel at it uh, and really excite you about it? Uh, you're coming at it from a performer standpoint. I come at it from a coach also as a promoter uh, because I've promoted quite a few time trials uh, in my day, uh, several state championships and watching that progression over time happen because uh, I hyped it and I marketed it quite a bit. And <laughs> and uh, I think I've told you this story before. Uh, first year I hosted the Tennessee State Time Trial. I think we had a little over 100 people sign up. Uh, by the third or fourth year that I did it, uh, I had close to 250 people, Wow, uh, which is maybe one of the bigger state time trials in the country because ordinarily only specialists go to it. And I pulled in people you would not expect. And so uh, it can be done and you can do it. And so, all right, coach Zach. um, Yeah. What, what to you, let's go back in your mountain bike days and you're getting into road racing. Like one, what attracted you to time trialing? Because as I said earlier, you've gotten very good at it. And we're going to talk about your performances in the past and at the most recent uh, pro nationals and elite nationals. But for you, how and why did time trialing become attractive to you? Well, you know, I, I kind of got into it because it was the race of truth, right? There were, there were uh, mainly factors that I could control related to my outcome. Um, and it's something very miserable um, where you know, you're of course racing the fastest guy there, but you're also racing yourself. Um, and so there's a lot of measurables related to your execution and your position and things that were just totally fascinating to me. Um, cause yeah, I got in the sport just a handful of years ago where there was kind of this like new flow of information online. Um, and I could get better at time trialing at home, you know, with my feet up. So, um, I think that the, yeah, the, the ability to, to do research and then test it out on the road and, you know, look at how you relate to your old efforts on the same sections of road or at the same races was uh, really interesting to me. And, you know, the big bonus getting into the sport 
the way that I did, um, not having the bike handling skills or a lot of history on a bike, uh, time trialing felt safer. Uh, it felt more accessible to me where I wasn't stressed out about potentially impacting somebody else's race, um, where, you know, all I had to do was my own thing. And, you know, and then at the end, I got to see whether I was, you know, the first or last finisher. So that was, yeah, that was definitely the, the most enticing thing for me. Um, and it, it's got its own culture, man. The, the people there, they love the gear, they love the tech, they love being excited and, and you know, talking about how much uh, discomfort they were able to put themselves through on that given day. Um, and so I, I think it's just a, a really cool community of, uh, of folks who really enjoy time trialing. That's a, that's a good word, community. And you're right, there, it is unique and special. Uh, and I think too many people look at it as though, just like other aspects of the sport, where you're either in that club or you're not in that club. And I, again, I'd like to expand that club, the size of that club, because just like all other areas of cycling, time trialists love to talk, love to share, love to talk about those things and oh, yeah. share that knowledge with other people and pull them into it because yes, it is the truth. You find out the truth and there's no excuses uh, at the end of any performance. There's reasons perhaps. Uh, and then it's all up to you about what you're going to do about uh, getting stronger, getting faster uh, and improving those times that you talk about. And so let's start with, just I've, I've written down what I think are some of the key fundamentals, and I know that there's more uh, to this. And, and one of those first fundamentals that could be a hurdle for someone is just seeing themselves as, as having the ability to time trial mm -hmm. uh, and just looking at, you know, people like yourself who specialize in it now and are good at it at the highest level or even someone in your state or region you see, ah. Uh, I'm just nowhere in their league, so I'm not even going to try it. But it it's something that, yeah, of course, it, those that are born with a, a big engine can benefit, but you have to work at it. But even if you're not born with these specific genetics, you can work at it. So let's talk about ability first. What what's What abilities, one, help if you have going into it, or what abilities can you cultivate over time and improve upon to help make you a better time trials. Yeah. Um, I think the, the biggest ability or the biggest skill that time trialing helps with is pacing and understanding um, the scale of uh, perceived exertion, right? So how deep can I go right now in this moment based on how much I have in the tank and how much road is left in front of me uh, during this race? So you know, a lot of, a lot of mountain bikers or, or cyclocross racers are actually phenomenal time trialists because they understand pacing and their events are much more similar to a time trial than a road race would be. So um, I think, yeah, one, one of the biggest things has got to be pacing, you know, and, and everybody make, makes mistakes with pacing um, all the way through their careers, you know, no, no matter how good you get at time trialing, pacing is, is typically a very big issue. Um, but it's a discipline that, that carries over really well. It, you know, you can understand mountain bike pacing based on what your, what your 40 K pace is for a time trial, your, you know, your hour of power, that kind of thing. So, um, I think that, yeah, people who do a lot of time trialing really understand their body and their pacing and their ability to put out, you know, a certain power for a certain duration on that given day. Um, because a lot of times <laughs> you, you have a really good day in training and it totally messes up your perception of what your pace is on any given day. So, yeah, I think that's that's got to be the huge one for me. Yeah, I agree with you. And you make a great point that bike racers in other disciplines cross, uh, yeah, XC racers in, in mountain biking uh, and other aspects, you are yeah, there's points in the race that you're essentially time trialing. You're pacing yourself for a given period according to the length of the race, or maybe you're in a breakaway, maybe you're chasing off the back, whatever it might be, you're time trialing. And uh, so working on that, I, I agree with you, uh, pacing uh, is key. Are there any other sort of abilities uh, that that we want to we wanna touch on before we move on another fundamental? Because again, yeah, being good at that pacing is, it, it, I think in general in all the sport, pacing mm -hmm. is key if you want to be successful. 
but is there, are there any other abilities that you think, all right, having this, or if you don't have it, cultivating this skill uh, can feed into, hey, just getting excited about it. Yeah, um, man, like being able to carry speed, I think is another cross-discipline thing that is like totally amazing that time trialing like really teaches you about, you know, cause on your little data screen, we can talk about this later, but one of the big things is speed because all you're trying to do in almost any kind of race is just get to the finish line first. And, you know, understanding how to carry speed up and over rollers or whether, you know, this is a good time to rest or things like that. You know, the, the time trialing, I think gives you a, a great understanding of, of speed and how to carry it and, um, continue to maintain that momentum. So, and that's something that is, I think, important to to start paying attention to and, and improve on from the time you're doing 14 miles an hour in a time trial to the time you're doing 28 miles an hour in a time trial. It doesn't matter. So, you know, even if even if you're you're someone who thinks that they're not super good at time trialing, you know, the the speed maintenance and the ability to pace is something you're going to improve on every time you go out and do a time trial. So. Um, and that could be your local, you know, Strava segment with, with your buddies, or it could be a, a 40K state championship race. Yeah, you make a great point there about momentum. Mm -hmm. And we see this in group rides. You see it in training. And uh, some are better that, than others at creating that momentum. And then, as you said, holding that pace and momentum. Uh, and especially in time trial and force times velocity <laughs> uh, because the person with the highest average speed is the person that's going to win any bicycle race. And, and then everyone else is going to slide in behind them, regardless of what discipline that you're racing. It's all about the highest average speeds. And so if you're not able to, to carry that momentum and speed, uh, it is something definitely for people to, it's a skill. It yep. is absolutely a skill. And, finding out where you can create and take advantage of free speed. Totally. Uh, there's a lot of free speed out there that's available. Uh, you just have to know where to look for it, how to create it, how to take advantage of it. And time trialing isn't the place for this, but in other disciplines, taking free speed off of the work of other people. Yeah. Uh, and so again, yes, I agree with you on that one. All right. So another fundamental, and I'll put this second instead of first or last, and, and that is just your mindset, the mindset you have to have to approach time trialing, to, to just pour yourself into it, to do it, to get over that hump, that mental hump. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about mindset as a fundamental to time trialing. Yeah. So I think mindset goes with kind of my, my third fundament or third ability, which is kind of your, your ability to suffer, your ability to like give everything in a time trial, you know? Um, and it being such a, a somewhat simple discipline where, you know, your mindset has to be, I'm just going to, to the best of my ability, just leave it all out there. You know, I'm, I'm here to suffer and, you know, really grip my teeth and, and just empty the tank. Um, so I think it's, it's more about leaving everything out there and doing your best on that day to, you know, to execute, to, to pedal your bike as hard as you can to maintain the momentum. Um, I think it's way more about that than it is to get a certain result at a time trial. Um, because, you have no impact on anybody else. So, you know, to, to go out there or to discount yourself because you're just not going to win or whatever, um, I think is kind of short-sighted where, you know, it's, it's almost like a, a really good training day at its very worst. Um, so having that kind of mindset of, you know, it doesn't matter who shows up. It doesn't matter, you know, what kind of gear they're on. It, you know, it's, it's all about me and what kind of effort I can put down and, and how well I can execute my plan. Um, and just being able to block out all, all the other noise. So um, I think that's, you know, a super unique part of time trialing and something that you carry over to other disciplines. You know, we talk to kids at, at collegiate nationals, right? If, if, they're, if they have that ability to focus on their own race and not get wrapped up in what everybody else is doing, they're going to have a better outcome. So, you know, that, I think that's a huge thing that you get in doing time trialing is that ability to just hunker down and focus on your plan and execute it 
And then you have this number at the end that you can compare to your other results, right? You can see miserable improvement over days, weeks, months, years. So I think that's, that's an, another cool thing, especially if you have a club series, like a weekly or monthly series um, where you can, you know, test, see what you did in March compared to what you did in August. Yeah, that, uh, that's a, that's a key, that's a key thing because you didn't start this sport and specifically in time trial and, and be a national champion right out of the gate. That doesn't happen overnight. And uh, I, I also, I've never met a time trialist at the end of any race, even if they won, they always know like I could have, I could have yeah. had five more <laughs> seconds here. I could have done this there. Or then if they're short a few seconds or however much, they always are just, High, just very critical about everything that they did or did not do. Uh, and, but that's where the learning process begins. And just like anything, it's what you're going to do about it. Uh, you know, speaking firsthand, uh, you know, my mindset towards time trialing, yeah, has never been, I would say, uh, healthy as a performer if I wanted, you know, want to be honest about it because I, I just didn't see it as something uh, to invest a lot of my energy and time in. Uh, though, yeah, I know it would have been a tremendous benefit. And I did a few when I first got into racing. Believe it or not, I don't think I've ever told you this. I have won one time trial in my life. <laughs> nice. But it was a cat four. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> long, long time ago. Yeah. Hey, W is a W. And uh, but uh, it was fun. And I and I had fun. And it's always fun to just be able to go out there and, and give it your best, as you say, leave it all out there and see how you stack up against everyone else. And but mindset is that thing that if you can be in the right mindset about what it is that you're doing, specifically time trial, because as you say, it's not easy. You don't you don't throw in the towel uh, when you're time trialing. It is you just go as hard as you can go for as long as you can to that finish line. Uh, and I think the thing that, as I look at it, that gets a little bit overlooked is how how time trials can improve your mindset in general if you do them because it's going to it's going to make you appreciate all the other aspects of the sport because you you're doing something that perhaps isn't the best uh, your best skill set but you're you're do, you do it anyway so that you uh, learn and you grow and you trust it's going to benefit you in other areas of the sport so to just set it aside and think ah. I'm not going to do it because, oh, I'm just not good at it or I don't like it. Um, you know, if you can flip a switch in your mindset and just begin to do it, embrace it uh, and give it a shot and give it a very honest best effort over time, it's going to make you a better bicycle racer in all areas of the sport. Yeah, totally. And I mean, for a lot of us who live in hilly areas, you know, time trial is the only, only like true however long 20 minute FTP test we can get, you know, um, in training, it's a killer workout. So, um, yeah, we're, we're always too hard on ourselves with, with this kind of stuff and, you know, doing them for experience and, and doing them just get better at breakaway tactics or, you know, whatever it is, your pacing, your understanding of, of how, um, how your bike moves forward and how you should, you know, try and go as fast as possible for the least amount of work. Like, um, there's so much more than just like going out there and trying to win your, win your local time trial that you can take away from it. So, well, let's not forget, uh, we're all on Strava. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is, I, what, what is Strava? Yeah. It's time trial leaderboards for every road in America. <laughs> Bingo. It's exactly what it is. So mm -hmm. we're all already doing it Yeah. and we are, we are comparing ourselves to ourselves. I do that mostly, uh, I love to go into my all my efforts of a, a given section and uh, compare the times and also uh, you know, how was I feeling this week versus last week and, and, and other weeks and go, oh, OK, I can. You, it, it gives you such great perspective uh, when you dig into your own performances and then, yeah, compare yourself a little bit to others and say, well, all right, well, they're just in front of me. Maybe if I do this differently. Uh, I, I can improve upon my time, maybe beat this other person. Uh, but in the end, if you can beat someone else uh, that's ahead of you, you know what? The benefit is you beat yourself. 
Yep. And I think that's the key is that you beat yourself, but that's Strava in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, Strava, Strava is like the, the like perfect tool if you're a, a time trial nerd, but it can also be your worst enemy, right? Because you can, uh, you can end up doing a time trial every day of the week, trying to, trying to beat your PRs and, and, and beat your buddy down the street. So that's a, that's a very good point. Strava is, is time trial central and, and most people don't even, don't even realize it. Yeah. All right. So moving on, we're going to get to uh, uh, the next fundamental, which is uh, the real uh, at, at the higher you go in this sport becomes more and more important. And it's equipment, mm -hmm. your equipment. As you as you get better, you improve your ability, you change your mindset, you really go into it. You start getting higher and higher at the levels uh, and going against tougher competition. All of a sudden, equipment becomes a bigger determinant in the outcome of the race. So, all right, Zach, I know this is the one area you are you are totally all in. You love it. Uh, equipment. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so I guess we'll we'll start by prefacing this that the only equipment you need is a helmet and a bike. And everything else is is, you know, uh there's there's a bell curve of like will it make you a faster, better cyclist, you know, up to a certain point it it impacts greatly your performance and then there's this drop off where you're you're spending a lot more money for a lot less result. So, um you know, the, the equipment, there is a, a category, we call it the Merckx category after Eddie Merckx. Um, it's road bike only. It's very limited aerodynamic equipment. Um, and, you know, some, some places allow you to have a, a special time trial helmet and some don't, and then there's only certain wheels you can ride. And it's, it's very bare bones, right? And in a way, if you're, if you're doing time trialing to get better at other disciplines, this is the perfect place for you. Um, it's something you can roll up to, you can ride to the, these, pin a number on, do your time trial and ride home, you know? Um, yeah, so up to, to that point, mm -hmm. when I was promoting the state time trials in Tennessee, I had a Merckx category every year and it started out small. Uh, I had a short option, I had a, had a 20K option, and I had a 40K option because 40K was, was really, that was the big race. But what I found over the course of three or four years, that Merckx category grew tremendously. And people I thought would never do it, did it. And like you said, all you need is a bike and a helmet. And you just get in there. And yeah, we instituted some rules that you could use a skin suit. You could have a TT helmet. We had a certain size of wheels that you could use. And we have that in collegiate as well, because we don't use time trial bikes in collegiate, though we used to many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a great point about the Merckx category. And even if there is not a Merckx category at the race, there's nothing stopping you from using you just regular road racing equipment. Uh, and, and if you're in the lower categories, more times than not, that's what everyone is using anyway. Yeah, totally. Like category four or five racing. I mean, it, you know, to, I, I would say save your money on the, on the time trial bike, you know. And then once you once it becomes more evident you're doing stage racing and things where a time trial bike makes a significant impact, then you can, you know, look at investing the money or, or figure out how to get a time trial bike. So no, I'm, I think Merck's category is, is fantastic. And, and it's like a, it's a huge boost to, you know, just local racing scene. If you're able to have somewhere you can do a, a bi-weekly uh, time trial and have a big Merck's category where people can just roll up and do it. Um, so yeah, I think that's awesome. And, um, yeah, so if we had that, like, um, I would definitely have done those when I got out of the sport. Yeah. Well, suppose someone comes up to you and says, Hey Zach, I'm interested in, uh, yeah, I, I've been doing time trials for a couple of years. I enjoy it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to invest in equipment. I mean, of course there's bikes out there, but if you're walking them through, talking them through, here's, here's the steps and here's what you should focus on first second third what would be those things that you would uh you would advise them to do mm -hmm. um so typically the way we think about this is like how much speed do you get for your dollar and the the biggest impact on your speed is going to be your aerodynamics 
And the biggest impact on your aerodynamics is your position on the bike. It's not the bike. Um, so your, your drag and how you go through the air is 80% of your total drag. And then the bike is 20%. So I always, um, advise people to work on their position first. So as you know, even if it's on a road bike, um, there's a certain way where you can hold your hoods on your road bike and have your elbows at a 90 degree angle and have your head nice and tucked. And it is significantly faster. It's more aerodynamic than being in the drops than, you know, sitting on your road bike normally. So things as simple as position, which is not that simple, but <laughs> like, that's always where I suggest people to start. Um, and then from there, you know, uh, either getting clip on aero bars for your road bike. Um, if you're, you know, just a hobbyist or, um, someone looking to get into it, um, and then taking the jump to a specific time trial bike, um, is kind of how, you know, I suggest the flow to go. And then from, from getting a time trial bike, you open a whole lot of doors into, uh, wheels and all the things, um, related to that bike. Um, but position is, is definitely number one. And then, um, your, your skin suit going from a club Jersey and bibs to a skin suit and then to something that's, you know, very form fitting and aerodynamically manufactured to be fast. Um, and then getting a time trial helmet that fits. So, um, and yeah, so there's like a, a huge list and everything costs way too much money and it's, it's super, you know, kind of, kind of daunting to, to think of all the different equipment needs. But I, I think, you know, um, if you can, if you can get a time trial bike, you get a good skin suit and a helmet, then everything else is, is, is bonus. Right. So, um, even something like a disc wheel for your, for your rear wheel is not going to save you as much time or, you know, create extra speed. Um, if your position is bad or, if you don't have a good skin suit or if you're not wearing a time trial helmet. So. Well, on that point, you, you, you know, you brought up aerodynamics and mm -hmm. of course drag. So as people are thinking about uh, their equipment and they're making these investments, uh, as you said, it's about deciding for yourself, you know, how much, what's going to be the return in in savings as it relates to saving power and increasing speed uh, but aerodynamics you know what are we've had a an episode where we've talked about bike fitting with todd watermeyer we talked about aerodynamics with Heath dotson uh, what are some considerations as a time trialist when we're talking about drag aerodynamically what are say the top three or four things for someone to really focus on to uh, improve their drag so that the, it, their effort they're having to put out is less and they go faster. What are, what are the key areas to focus on first without having to go to a wind tunnel to have this done for you? Yeah. So <laughs> the, the caveat to this always is uh, when you're dealing with aerodynamics, it's, it's something that you can't see. You can't tangibly uh, manipulate this in the same way you can, uh, uh, other things, right? So it's air. Um, so the answer is always, it depends, but <laughs> the, the biggest things, um, that, that we found is, uh, basically being able to have your hands as close to your face and closing the gap between the top of your helmet and your elbow. Um, so creating, uh, almost bullet shape in the front of the bike, um, is very important. Um, that's something you can do on almost any bike. Um, and then, you know, the, the second one would be closing the gap between the back of your helmet and your head, um, to again, kind of create that, that same bullet shape. Um, and the, what you're talking about there is, um, uh, you know, n avoiding looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up, being consistent in your head position, because yeah, that's going to create we always think of drag as that frontal, uh, from that frontal aspect of things, but but really, you know, air also is going all over and around our body and bike, and it's how that air responds after it hits us that really makes the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so to that point, without getting too nerdy, one of the biggest areas of drag is actually underneath your saddle. 
um, air pulls back there and it actually it physically pulls you backwards. So that's the that's the tricky thing with aerodynamics, right? Because um, there's just all these little pockets of air everywhere that, that do different things. So um, yeah, I think one, I mean, one of the biggest things is just position maintenance, right? So um, if you want to get faster, get in a position that's sustainable, <laughs> like, and people will like swear up and down that they can hold whatever position that, that they put themselves in and they want you to, you know, tell them how fast they're going to be. And it's just like, man, I know for a fact, no one can hold what you're trying to do right now. So like be realistic and, you know, try and try and stay strong on a bike where you're able to put out power and you're comfortable and you can see up the road um, instead of trying to, to game the system and, you know, look super fast in this like, one second out of your, you know, 25 mile time trial where you're looking straight down at your stem and, you know, it's only two minutes into your efforts. So you're not hurting. And um, yeah, so I think sustainable position and, and being able to recreate that same position every time you race is, um, is so important. So that you have this data and you can kind of like go back to it. And then if you make some changes, there's changes that are still sustainable. And then you can see if you went faster as a result. Um, I think that's, I think from the comfort and discomfort standpoint, yeah. you, your discomfort wants to come from the effort itself. You know, that, that's what mm -hmm. should, should be driving the, the discomfortability of what's going on. Uh, the comfort should come from the position, even though it's still going to be a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to be, in, it's not going to be like racing your road bike normally. Uh, so it is going to be a somewhat uncomfortable position but we're going to talk about that how you can train that over time to where it becomes a comfortable thing you go from a discomfort zone to the comfort zone but yeah you have to be able to sustain it and if it's unsustainable uh it's one thing if it's a short time trial a little prologue that's you know five minutes eight minutes or something but but the longer ones you've got to you've got to be able to hold that position uh, and not fall to pieces and so yeah, aerodynamics is key. The the uh, bike fit, the position is key, and that that all plays into your equipment. And so, as someone is investing all of these uh, resources and time, don't overlook your your aerodynamics and get help. Uh, you know, you can do a lot on your own, but also seek the help of uh, experts who are bike fitters or people with. Uh, wind tunnel uh, experience, or you could even go to a wind tunnel mm -hmm. uh, if you're really nerdy and want to get the most out of it. But uh, I think as you have learned through that process, things that you thought you knew uh, were not what you thought, and you learned some new things about uh, aerodynamics in general, but also to you specifically. Yeah, totally. And that's, uh, it is kind of the fun thing about time trialing that there's, there's always something to be learned and there's always something to be gained, um, through either, you know, increased power production or, you know, lower, uh, total system drag. Um, and you can tinker indefinitely with these things and it could be faster or slower depending on a million different reasons. So it's, uh, it's definitely something to look into, um, avoid the, uh, the eyeball wind tunnel, um, from your buddies as much as possible. Um, because it's, there's just no telling, right? Like the more, the more cooks in the kitchen on your time trial position, probably the, the further off from <laughs> comfortable or sustainable or powerful you're going to get. Can only, and then, can only be one chef, bro. One chef it's, and a sous chef. Yeah. So I, yeah, I have a couple, I have a couple friends and usually I like, will will ask like five opinions on everything and just smash them all together and take like one little piece out of it and then try it for myself. Um, but you can't, you can't overhaul based on somebody else's eyeballs. It just, it just doesn't work. So, you know, there's a thing that I like what, I, uh, what you do, uh, you and I've talked about this and you shared that in the winter or, you know, say you're on the trainer or you get to that point in the com competition phase of the season, you will video yourself, uh, in the time trial position on your bike, on a trainer, uh, and, and review the video. So maybe discuss that and share that little, little trick and tip and how you've utilized that to your benefit. Sure. Um, 
Yeah. So the, we talk about the eyeball wind tunnel. So basically what, um, what we'll do is set up just your phone camera, uh, hop on your time trial bike on the trainer, pedal for a couple minutes, get warmed up, um, kind of sink into whatever position you think is, is what your race position is going to be. And then just take a two minute video, um, put out some decent power in it. Um, and that way you have kind of these, these different baselines of, you know, I've changed X, Y, Z, and here's what it looks like. So, um, the other, the other important thing for that is, is like making sure there's a dot on the wall or something that is uh, similar to the horizon. So, you know, where, you know, if you get out on the road, you're going to be able to look up and see what's ahead of you. Um, cause a lot of times with the eyeball wind tunnel, people end up staring at the forearms because they're on a trainer. They don't need to look up. Um, so yeah, having all these videos is really important, um, because it, you know, it, it helps you with, uh, understanding your own bike fit. Um, if you change something on your front end, it affects how you pedal and, and things like that. So, you know, if you make these changes and then you look at those videos and you notice that something's totally, totally different. Um, you at least have visual proof of, of what you've done and you can figure out how to put it back. Or if you like it, you can keep it and, and take another video and that become your new baseline. And this is, we're talking about really the art of practice here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the art of practice. This is deep practice. I suspect, I, you've not told me this, but I suspect what, when you go uh, with your team to wind tunnel testing, that you get videos of this and are able to see yourself in the best position, producing the best power and speed, that then you can take that and replicate that, uh, use, again, using that video and practicing it at home, filming yourself. I mean, is that something that you have done uh, to help you practice that position and, and get comfortable with it? Yeah, so in the wind tunnel, they'll take pictures um, of every single run. Um, and every run has aerodynamic data attached to it. So you get this big folder of all the different positions and, and different things that they've tried and the aerodynamics related to it. Um, and what kind of happens there is most of those positions will continue to improve your aerodynamics. And uh, as your aerodynamics goes down, um, a lot of times, unless it's, you know, they've made some huge change, um, it'll become slightly more stressful in some way to make you slightly faster. So you're, you're gonna like continually get these lower numbers, which means your aerodynamics are better and you would go faster for the same output. Um, but the position will become more stressful and sometimes less realistic if you're going to do these, you know, hour long or multiple hour long time trials. So um, having all of that data is really important because you can pick you know, the, the one that is the fastest while still being the most sustainable um, and powerful. So um, yeah, I pour over that stuff. Um, they also give us data or access to each other's data from that given day. So normally it won't be just be one person that goes in there. It'll be, you know, three or four people in, in four or five hours. And so having access to other people's data and seeing, you know, um, what they've done because everybody's, uh, morphology is very different. You know, we have, I have a teammate who's like six, five. So being able to use other people's data and translating that to my athletes and, you know, like uh, telling them, well, this is what, this is what was fast for him. So trying to, trying to recreate that position for you is going to get you somewhere in the ballpark of this, you know, and, and it's bad to attach real numbers to any of that um, because everybody's so different but having that data is crucial. And, you know, the, the more times we go, the more data you acquire and, and the better your eyeball wind tunnel becomes too. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's the key. Cause when we started, we had no idea. We, we thought we were spot on with, you know, whatever, uh, Tom Dumoulin or whoever we thought we were going to, um, replicate time trial positions from. And, and we were so far off, you know, um, just even, even your eyeball wind tunnel takes years of, years of practice to calibrate. Well, we have another fundamental we are going to talk about at the end about experience. Yeah. And it, experience is something that you and I have spoken a lot about with the level that you're at compared to the people that are ahead of you. Uh, and so, all right. Uh, so as you all can tell, equipment is a big thing, which that's a, that's a, a self-evident uh, fundamental of the sport. 
but uh, but there's, as you have said and highlighted, there's so many different aspects and it's up to each individual to decide for themselves which one uh, they're going to make that investment in and uh, and utilize. Uh, and so, yeah. All right. So the next fundamental is uh, and I think this is the one that a lot of people focus on uh, more so than anything. And it is crucial. Uh, and it is the training side of time trialing because just going out and riding your bike like you would for all the other disciplines, whatever it is in the sport, that'll get you so far. But if you really are going to do time trials, you have to train for a period of time specifically for time trials. Uh, all right. So let's open that door. Uh, what is what does the training look like and we want to presuppose now we want to just assume something here that hey you're already training right you're doing you're doing the right things to build that aerobic engine and your muscular endurance uh, and you have you know a thing or two about pacing but when we want to get down to the nitty-gritty the specificity of training let's let's maybe take this from the example of yourself uh, this past year or in the past uh, seasons where you have a big goal. Your big goal this year is pro nationals and elite nationals. Uh, what was your training like or what would be appropriate training for someone as they're building into that so-called peak moment at a big event? Let's break that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so one of the, one of the things that I always come back to with, with time trialing is why, you know, why is it so different from riding a road bike? Why doesn't that just translate right over? Um, and some of the, some of the big differences are obviously the position. So um, you're in a much more scrunched position. So it's something you have to consider um, in your training, right? So that um, you're, you're, you're using energy to pull yourself into this uh, aerodynamic position, um, which takes not only strength work off the bike, um, you know, core work, all that stuff and able so you can maintain that position. Um, but being able to train in that position gives you the opportunity to improve the muscles and, you know, stretch things out so that you're, you're able to produce similar power in that position to what you would do on your road bike. Um, your, your hip angle is a lot more closed. Um, it puts a lot more like stress on your vascular system and your legs to produce, you know, the supply your muscles with the same amount of oxygen because you're, you're impinging through your hip. Um, so all these things need to be taken into consideration when you're training. So doing hard efforts on your time trial bike is crucial. Um, doing them, you know, one of the big things I was doing is a lot of like high cadence work in time trial position, um, all basically all the way through the spring and summer, um, towards these races, uh, because it just kind of like, doubly stresses your system you know high cadence is not something that's ever super comfortable doing 110 to 130 rpms um but then doing them in this very demanding position kind of gives you the the double stress you know and and being able to do it on a day where you've you've already been fatigued from a road bike workout the day before and you know it's it's not going to be your your best power um it was was like something that was very good for me um we did a lot of them and i felt you know better as a result. So um, having key workouts on your time trial bike is going to be very important um, if you're taking the discipline very seriously um, and having the, the strength foundation um, in order to maintain your position um, so that you can go out and do a two or three hour ride on your time trial bike is like crucial. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. And then as far as like uh, building up towards that peak, it's, it was actually for me, very similar to just like being a road racer and peaking for a road race. Um, because yes, the, the time trial is a big goal at, at pro nationals, but I also had to be in, in fighting shape in order to one survive and two try and like do well in the road race, which was only a couple of days later. So, um, you know, doing the, doing your base work early on, um, having some race intensity in your legs, you know, your, your threshold work, and then doing a typical peak where you're going through VO2 max and, and doing your 40 twenties and all these things, and just mixing in, uh, time trial bike workouts, wherever you can, um, was, was pretty much my strategy. I know that doesn't sound like, uh, super focused on the time trial, but that, you know, there's, there's a lot of things where you just kind of like take what you can get. 
Well, the question there then is, suppose you're someone who they're not going to maybe be a specialist, but they're going to do them. The big question a lot of times is, and this goes for just workouts in general, how many days a week should I do these workouts uh, or that workout? How many days should I be doing this or that? So for time trialing, uh, let's say you're someone who is serious, you know, how many days a week should you be on your time trial bike? And for how long in advance of that big goal? And so, or if you're not a specialist, mm -hmm. how frequently and how soon should you be getting on your time trial bike uh, or working on these things, even in a merch position, uh, to, to be ready and not, not have a cram session that final week before because it's too late then. It is totally too late. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, if let's say you're a time trial specialist, um, I think two to three days a week um, is reasonable to be on your time trial bike. Um, I don't recommend people doing like endurance rides on the time trial bike. Uh, one of the things my coach was very like adamant that I not do is like the coffee shop spin on your time trial bike. Um, and one of the reasons is that it doesn't really help you. Like it, it's cool from the sense like you're riding your time trial bike and you look like you're super legit on this, uh, on this easy spin. But the big thing is you're, you know, you're, it's a very demanding position. And the only times you're really going to get better or improve that position is when you're going hard in it. So, um, you know, for, for most of the people I work with, they have very flexible schedules. Um, they're either college kids or, you know, aspiring like elite athletes. So normally what we do is kind of like four day blocks. So on the first day, it will be your, your meat and potatoes, your very like difficult, um, intervals it's it's the first you're fresh you're ready for them um and so if you're a time trial specialist you might do that day on your time trial bike your sweet spot work your threshold work your vo2 max work um and then the next day um could be another time trial bike workout you have a little bit of fatigue but you're still feeling pretty good um and then those two days are all, most always followed by endurance day of whatever distance based on what you can handle what you have time for um so on your road, on your road, bike. on your road bike. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're really, really trying to try and improve your time trialing and this is like your sole focus, then, you know, maybe the first two days of the block you would do, um, on your time trial bike and just like really focus on doing whatever efforts in the position, um, and, you know, do that for two, three months. Right. So, um, you know, the, the gains are not going to be instant. So, you got to, you got to really give yourself time to adapt to it. Um, well, it's definitely, it's one of those things where you're going to get out of it, what you put into it, mm -hmm. uh, especially time trial. And I think, you know, to your point about say those, the block training or depending upon how much you're able to invest duration wise, everyone's on a different plane. When it comes mm -hmm. to that, you might be a master's uh, uh, level rider or whomever, depending upon your life schedule. Uh, and, and that is, I know for you, I mean, you break up workouts where a part of it is on your time trial bike and then you're either beginning or finishing on your road bike uh, just because your days are big. And, you know, like you said, uh, I like the point about you want the time trial bike work to be about the actual type of work you're going to be doing in those races and not sure. getting junk miles, so to speak on your time trial bike. And so breaking those workouts up on the same day could be something that works for people. Yeah, totally. And, you know, for the, for the not time trial specialist, usually, you know, like do your, do your key workouts on your road bike. And then that second day, maybe it's a little bit shorter. So you can do the whole thing on your time trial bike and get some quality in and then just be done. Um, you know, not, not spending three, four hours on your time trial bike. Um, I don't think that that's ever like very comfortable. I know some people who can do it and who really enjoy it, but like for most people get it done they're in called, two hours. They're called triathletes. They're called triathletes. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like a very different breed and they're like hardcore and, and definitely super athletes, but we're not triathletes. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I love what you said though, starting off. And this is something you and I've talked about in the past. And number one, that's flexibility. Mm -hmm. It's important to have a, a bit of flexibility. You don't have to be a yoga queen or a yoga king 
but you do need to have some uh, range of motion in your shoulders, in your hips, uh, some elongation within some of the, the muscular uh, uh, stir, uh, mu muscular stir, however, whatever, however you say that, mm -hmm. within your body. Because what I have found over the years is that you hear uh, a lot of the same things being said by time trialists that you do from mountain bikers early in their season, in that it really hits the low back. Uh, it's a great strain on your glutes, your hamstrings, and your low back. So flexibility and core work. Core should be at the at the center of everyone's training program. But for time trialists, it's especially important because we all think of uh, our engine or our legs. But boy, if you've got a weak upper body, uh, you're in, you're in for an even bigger world of pain and suffering just because you didn't put any uh, concentration on that. Yeah, totally. And I think people really discount just how important all of that like core stability and, and leg and upper body strength and, you know, just total body strength um, can, uh, how big of a difference it can make. So um, especially, you know, I always think uh, if, if you take a minute and think in zero gravity, what happens if you push down on a pedal on a bike, um, you would float off the seat, right? So you have to have some force resisting all of that power you're putting down onto the pedals and that comes in the form of stability through your core and um, either your low back or whatever you're hanging on to on the front of the bike. So, you know, mountain bikers are a great example because of the, the dynamic nature of the terrain and they have to put out power in all of these kind of like contorted positions and stuff to make it over rocks and roots. Well, the same but almost opposite happens in a time trial where you're trying to do the, the minimal amount of movement uh, possible on on your bike to maintain this position. And it ends up being a very similar amount of stress on these same systems. You know, your, your low back is torched. My neck is always just destroyed after a long time trial. And it's because you're, you're just dying to hold this position um, and, you know, maintain some level of stability. Cause if you're squirming all over your bike, you know, you're, you are disturbing and perturbing the air around you. And um, it, it, has some impact on your your total speed yeah you know when someone's tired by how they're fighting their bike and the yep. amount of movement on their bike and that goes for any discipline any type of race i like what you said about uh training the different uh energy system so to speak within uh normal training and how that affects time trial training and not just going out and doing a bunch of sub threshold and threshold because there's more to it than that. And we'll speak about that in relation to uh, the difference between your pro nationals time trial, which was very different than the elite nationals time trial. The courses mm -hmm. are different, but there's moments when uh, you're using uh, a slightly different energy system for a brief period of time. And so working all those things is, uh, is important. And it's not just going long and hard for one steady effort the whole time. Yeah. Definitely, you know, and uh, I think the 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 pan flat forty k is like an awesome test of a lot of things, but it's not reality in time trialing. A lot of times, there's there's so much uh, dynamic uh, course conditions, and you know, if there's a hill on the course, and and how do you pace all these different things, and and that really is where time trialing I think gets really interesting. Um, because there's, you know, there's levels to pacing and strategy and, you know, how do you, how do you use this limited amount of energy that you have um, in the best way possible? So. All right. Well, to finish up on the training side of things, uh, are, I'm sure a question to, to me or to you would be, okay, so what do those intervals look like? Um, mm -hmm. What are, what is a workload? Uh, what does that look like? Is it uh, what, how long are the intervals? How much total work of that interval should I do? Uh, yeah, give some examples of that for you that you think, let's say that someone's a beginner to immediate uh, uh, rider compared to say an elite cat one or two and pro. Yeah, the difference is there, but maybe share a little bit of the specificity of the training, what that actually looks like. Sure. Yeah. So one of the, one of the ways, um, you know, obviously we scale everything based on uh, your, your level in the sport and, you know, kind of what you can handle. So um, a lot of times with time trialing, it's almost like you're starting uh, at square one because it is a different position 
and it's it's typically very demanding and not something you'd practice just in you know in in passing and and not on a time trial bike so i'll i'll cut intervals up for people where it's you know uh start with some sweet spot work that's maybe high cadence or something like stressful to your like physical system but not necessarily to your aerobic or anaerobic system so four minute sweet spot at high cadence and then a two minute break and do a block of 30 minutes so you're only you're only doing you know uh, 24 minutes of, of total time that's stressful or um, within a 30 minute block, but you're, you're building up muscular fatigue as a result, because you want to be in the position, um, you know, practicing a good pedal stroke and, and having your, your aerodynamic tuck um, for as much of that as possible. Um, but it's not crushing you like your, your real key workout of the week is going to crush you. So um, starting off there, um, moving to some like longer kind of tempo workouts and then tempo with surges where you're trying to maintain a specific speed. Um, you know, you, if you know, you're, you're docking down, you want to, you want to average 300 Watts for the whole thing, but you want to go as fast as possible. So, so doing kind of games like that, where it's a mock time trial, um, but they have kind of a rev limiter on, on the, the total power they can use, um, is always good. Um, cause it teaches you how to like carry your momentum. You, you know, you're going to want, want more power put out on the Hills because you're going to be going slower. So you want to get over them. Um, and then on the downhills, you want to kind of rest and, and understand pacing, um, while trying to hit a watt target. That's not going to be, you know, super crazy for, for you, whatever that target is. Um, and then as you get closer, you're going to, you're going to start doing your, lactate threshold repeats um, on your time trial bike or some long tempo or, you know, things that are, are simulations that are 85, 90% of what a race condition would be like. Um, because, you know, a, a, especially a long time trial is, is very stressful. Um, it's not something that you would just do on any given Tuesday and, and go all out and then be able to like turn around and do uh, another key session the next day. So being kind of careful with with how deep you go on your time trial stuff, especially when you're adapting, I think is important. Um, and then once you're once you're able to handle it, you can do your your lactate threshold stuff on the time trial bike. Um, that you know start at eight minutes and go to fifteen or twenty minutes, um, and and that's when you know that you know you're you're very well adapted to your position. And if you're an athlete out there, I think a good place to start is, well, what is the actual race I'm going to do? What mm -hmm. is the distance? What's the duration? And understand you don't have to replicate that exact thing in an interval. You can break that work up and gradually build up, as you said, you know, your muscular endurance, your aerobic capacity, and just being able to handle that stress and just trust that over time, as you piece that puzzle together, it'll come together on race day. Uh, you know, yeah, if you want to go out a few weeks before and replicate that just to see where you're at and try to do it, that's, I think, a really good thing. Uh, but through those workouts, as you said, multiples of eight minute efforts or 10 or 15, depending upon what your actual race is. This is one of those things where just like other races, when you set your goals, what are the race demands? Like, because you had a specific preparation for pro nationals, that course is uniquely different than elite nationals and and so the preparation the mindset and the work of course you you had to do everything because you're doing everything but not everyone out there their goals could be a specific thing whatever your race is find out figure out what are the demands of that race train the things you need to get you ready for it and you can break it up you don't have to swallow it in one workout all at once you can break it up in that workout and just trust that over time, that consistency in that work uh, and the increase of that stress, you don't have, you can go from eight to 10, from 10 to 12, uh, or as you say, you get to a point where doing 60 total minutes of work is gonna be something you can handle, but you don't have to start out there. You can, you can dial it down and work yourself up. I think that's a key thing that a lot of people overlook. Yeah, I totally agree. Um... And yeah, the, if people like, especially they just get a little too excited, <laughs> you know, you get this new bike and you want to take it out and, and just kill it. Or you didn't, ah, oh, this is the worst. You didn't do well in your first time trial. So you're going to like 
step it up right and and that's where you can really get in trouble um doing too much so it's it's the same thing as as training for any other kind of event um you don't yeah you don't need to do the full race um to to be prepared for the race so breaking things up into manageable chunks and just you know doing perfect practice of eight minutes if your event is 45 minutes long is is still going to get you a long way towards towards you know being successful in that event Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've got the next fundamental I wanted to touch on um, is I think we've actually discussed it throughout this whole thing that we're saying, and that is competition. Competition mm -hmm. meaning the race itself, not not the competitors that you're going against, but competition uh, and the types of competition that's out there. You've alluded to that midweek uh, time trial series that, well, they're all over the country. They're out there uh, and to go do those. And they exist on the mountain bike. They exist on the road bike. Uh, that's what's really cool, I think, about time trialing is it's not limited to road, but competition and how uh, as you were getting into this sport and you realize, man, I, this is kind of fun. This is I'm kind of good at it. How did you then go about figuring out what races to do and what's available uh, before you even knew about equipment and training and mindset it's like wow uh what what would you say to just the competitions and races itself mm -hmm. yeah so um you know like starting starting out i looked the, um so i'm from roanoke virginia um so we race a lot of the mid-atlantic stuff and uh mid-atlantic bike racing association mabra um has a fantastic time trial series um where you know, it's maybe six or eight events a year. And a couple of those are attached to stage races. Um, and most of them are just standalones. So um, I looked at the Maverick calendar and was able to, you know, pick two or three events um, that I was going to focus on. And, you know, you, you sign up for them and you, you just like, you just show up the first time. And uh, so we, yeah, we don't have a midweek series around here, but um, you know, there's, there were, a couple of races that were within a couple hours and you just show up and it's like bike nerd heaven. <laughs> and, um, you know, everybody, everybody there is super serious and, and focused on what they have to do, but it's always, you know, as, as soon as you get done with your, with your event, um, your, your competition becomes like your best friend. They roll over to your, your car and talk about your setup and how hard it was. And, you know, how did you take that turn and, and everything. So yeah, it's, um, it was, it was cool being able to, to compete at some like local and regional stuff um, to start out with where it's not that serious, right? You can, um, if you pass by someone, they're gonna be like, hey man, like, you know, at this point in the race, you're, you know, you were kind of falling apart. I saw your position, your head was super high up and, and being able to get that feedback um, was really good. And, you know, there are only a couple bucks to, to enter and it was like two hour car drive and you're home at lunch and, um, so that, I think that's the appropriate level of competition to start out with. Um, I know that North Carolina has like the lung buster series and the chain buster series, um, which are like road bike and time trial bike respectively. Um, I think there's a mix of those that are like midweek and weekend. So something like that is super accessible to most people. Um, so I, I think starting there and that way it's not, you know, it's not in the middle of the stage race where, um, then that's that's like go time that's serious <laughs> yeah I, it's important to find those uh less serious moments to cut your teeth mm -hmm. and go through the motions of of learning the ins and outs and and also looking at time trials differently than you look at a criterium or road race you know how we road racers are we look at it and we say oh man it's just it's only a 45 minute crit i'm not going to drive three or four hours for just 45 minutes or the road yeah. race is not enough miles. Nah, nah I'm just not going to go. It's like, well, okay, but you're missing out on a moment to, to learn something about yourself and get better. Uh, and I think it's important to, this goes back to mindset about time trials is, Hey, it, yeah, it's going to be shorter, but it's a different experience and it's going to be fun. Uh, and, yeah, your whole day is not going to be eaten up by a bicycle race, which normally happens in all other aspects of the sport. Uh, your day is, is gone, which is fine, too. But look at it differently and say, well, even though it's five miles or 10 miles or whatever it might be to just say, well, 
that's what it takes. I'm going to go, I'm going to make the drive. I'm going to do it. I'm going to have fun. Uh, I'm going to learn from it. And yeah, use those low key local regional uh, series events and uh, get all those lessons out of the way, get them out of the way so that it will open doors for a state time trial championship, a uh, national time trial championship. And for you, you know, you're at a point now where you're comfortable entering the professional time trial championship here in America and would feel comfortable from these experiences, uh, you know, going uh, to Europe and during a time trial in Europe and like, okay, you're, you're kind of at that place now. So uh, yeah, don't overlook that, that time trial in your backyard, be it on the road or on the dirt, go do it and have fun and use it as, uh, as you, as we've said, and you said earlier, I believe uh, racing is training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And I mean, with, with anything like the, your ability to execute your like warm up and your equipment check and all those things. Um, if you're not really, really dialed in on that whole process, um, by the time these like big events or your key events for the year come up, um, you're, you're kind of leaving the door open for disaster to strike. And, um, I think that's uh, that's something that you can you can avoid by going to local events and you know taking them seriously, of course, and competing at a high level and getting your process of preparing for the event, setting everything up, warming up appropriately, your nutrition, hydration, all those things, execution of the race plan that you've devised, um, and then you know getting getting all that stuff dialed in um, at these local events is only going to help. Um, you know, and I mean, it's tough at collegiate when you, you know, kids show up who are super talented, but have obviously had some, some serious parental assistance with these processes before showing up to school. Um, and then they, you know, have critical errors um, at pivotal moments. And, uh, you know, all of that can be avoided by just, you know, going to going in and practicing that whole process over and over again. Um, yeah, routine is key routine. Yeah. And that goes for every aspect of competition in this sport is your routine. So you minimize that stress and just have that flow ready because boy, time trialists especially seem to react. Boy, they, it flips them out sometimes if that routine gets <laughs> disrupted. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm actually one of the bad ones. Cause I, I just end up talking and like, I mess other people up. You know what I mean? Cause uh, they'll be like, man, I got to get another trainer. I'm like, all right, but and then we talk for like 10 more minutes and like I screw their warm up up or something. So I'm, yeah, I'm one of the bad ones. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that stuck out, um, so I broke my collarbone, but ended up going to amateur nationals in 2019 to like kind of help out. Um, and so I was kind of shepherding all these like U23 riders um, through the whole process of getting ready for time trialing and, you know, making sure all their stuff is set up. Um, and one of the things I made sure was like two days in advance, their race wheels and everything was just like dialed in. Um, and they were all like, all right, sure. Thanks for, for doing that. That seems like a long time out. Um, but then on morning of a couple hours before the time trial, we get there, set everything up and you start hearing these bangs and it was people pumping up their disc wheels with their latex tubes for the first time in a couple months. And the latex tube sticks to the inside of the tire if you don't have like uh, a baby powder or something in the wheels and it will burst your tube. Mm -hmm. So this didn't happen once. It happened like seven times to people wow. over the course of a couple hours. And uh, changing a tube in a disc wheel that's latex while you're all sweaty in a parking lot is not what you want to do at the national championship race. So like, it's probably the most uh, standout example of like, just get your stuff done early um, and make sure it's, it's all working. And, you know, it, you just avoid so many problems doing it that way. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah, that's an extreme case <laughs> of, uh, of piddling around. You just, you cannot afford to piddle around. Yeah. Uh, I mean, race day is about race day and being prepared and being ready. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good one. And, when, and that leads to the, to the last fundamental. And then we'll get into some stories about your uh, experiences lately. And that last fundamental is experience mm -hmm. and how experience, we all know experience pays as a bicycle racer uh, and rider 
year after year after year. It's like compounding interest in the bank. Uh, but experience as a time trialist and the value of experience, you've learned it firsthand, you've gained from it, but you're learning from it still. Uh, talk about the importance of experience. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't fake it. You have to go out there and make the mistakes and uh, just continue to refine your process. And that goes for things as simple as like, don't go too fast into the U-turn, you know, like just things that you, you wouldn't think that you would, uh, mess up that, um, you know, you, you need to mess up at least once. So, um, compounding your experience, um, year over year, um, on what kind of training works for you, what position is realistic, all of these different things. Um, no, you just can't, you can't overlook the, the, the benefit of, of experience. So, um, going to those local time trials, even if local to me was like three hour drive, getting up at four in the morning to go do a time trial. Um, you know, you, you can't, um, you can't afford to miss out on those experiences because, you know, you can lean on them for, for when your A race comes up or, you know, when, when these opportunities to take advantage of really spectacular, uh, experiences comes up, like you'll, you'll be able to, to perform well on those stages because you have these experiences. Yeah. The more of those you build, you, you want to make sure that when you get to these more important races for yourself, that you've seen it before mm -hmm. you've been there before you've been through it, you know how to respond. And, you know, I love that saying, uh, I know a thing or two, uh, because I've seen a thing or two. Yeah. <laughs> and when you've seen a thing or two, uh, there's nothing like experiencing something to teach you. Uh, you've heard me say before, uh, you have to live it to learn it. And the more you can live it, the better you're going to learn it. Uh, and so gaining experience. I think another thing with experience that can really help, and this is why we're putting this show together, to, mm -hmm. to share knowledge and experience with everyone, and how someone can accelerate their growth as a time trialist is uh, learning directly from other people like yourself who, who have a heart and a passion for time trialing. And uh, again, doesn't matter if you are a mountain biker, doesn't matter if you're a pursuiter on the track, uh, it doesn't matter. Find someone who is good at it and loves it and pick their brain because there's no better way to accelerate your growth than learn from the experiences of other people so that you don't have to make those mistakes. You're like, oh, I, I never thought of that. I never knew that. Well, now you know, and you have no excuse. So just jump ahead of the line and use a, a friend or a mentor and yeah, just gain experience from other people's experience. Yeah, totally. Um... Yeah. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out too. you know, I, I love talking about this stuff and, and there's so much more that we haven't covered that is, you know, is still very like basic level necessity if you want to start doing well in time trialing. Um, so yeah, always reach out to anybody you see having kind of consistent success at this level. Um, anybody willing to teach is worth listening to. Um, you know, I have, um, I have a couple group chats ones with uh, most of the echelon guys um, and then there's one just called TT nerds and it's you know it's a conglomeration of some past teammates um, some juniors all kinds of people in there that you know uh, have a have a willingness and a desire to learn um, and we just share information I mean there's there's so much out there now that uh, sorting through it all um, is is very difficult and time consuming so letting someone else help you do that, um, I think can, can take you a long way into continuing to level up your understanding of, of this discipline. Yeah, good point. So, all right, so to finish off on the experience side of mm -hmm. things, uh, let's talk about your most recent experiences. Uh, you have just competed in the Pro National Time Trial Championship and the road race, mm -hmm. uh, and then you backed it up a few days later, the week after, at elite nationals and you did the time trial and the road race there as well but we're going to talk about the time trial experiences there because uh from my viewpoint well you know from yours too you had an ex outstanding uh performance in both of them really when you get right down to it you were 10th at pro nationals in knoxville fantastic result when you look at the names of the people ahead of you uh world tour riders and others who have a bit more experience than you do 
And then uh, you got your second national championship jersey. The first one coming in collegiate in mm -hmm. what, 2018 or 19? I, 19, yeah. 2019. All right, 2019 in Augusta. You got the individual national time trial championship uh, there with um, Midwestern State. Mm -hmm. And then you won elite nationals this year, 2021, uh, for Project Echelon in the time trial. So, man, well, first off, congratulations. A 10th in pro and a first in elite. I mean, that's, I think, a reflection of all these things that we were talking about today. It's, it, it really is a true reflection that you poured your heart and soul into it and continue to do that. And I know that you're, you're not satisfied. I know yeah, that. Thanks. <laughs> Definitely not satisfied. Um, <laughs> so talk us through going into, you've known for quite a while, it's going to be in Knoxville. You, you, I don't think you had done that course before, had you? No, uh, this was my first, first pro nats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but you had teammates who've been there many times before. I'm sure they told you a lot about it. You got to pre-ride it, do all the work. So talk us through that day and experience and, and what it was like for you uh, as you were, yeah, giving it everything you got on the, on the mm -hmm. most important day. Yeah. So fortunately, um, it is kind of a well-known time trial course and location. So the day before we were out there pre-riding, um, we got to do, you know, I think four, four total laps of the course. Um, and with, with any pre-ride where you have that opportunity, um, you, you know, redo sections that you think are going to be important. Um, so at, at pro nationals, it's three laps. Um, it's a total of like 22 miles, um, give or take. And every lap, there are three hills, uh, one of which is pretty decently big. And um, so it's, it's, it's technical. There's uh, nine U-turns in the course um, and one pretty like bomber descent um, off uh, onto like a, out of a left-hander kind of back on the main road. So there's a lot of stuff that you had to do in that pre-ride to make sure you were comfortable with. Um, and then, you know, uh, one of the things we we're partnered with my windsock, um, which is a software company that gives really detailed wind direction. Um, so we were able to use uh, my windsock in addition to best bike split and some of our own aerodynamic data that we got from the wind tunnel uh, to, to develop these pacing plans um, based on numbers we'd seen in training and, and understanding of, of all the stuff. So um, on race day, it was, it, it's kind of nice um, at this point where you, you are leaning on experience so much um, that there's really no nerves, you know, you show up super early, you get all your stuff done. Um, and then it's just a matter of, of warming up and just executing the plan. So um, I'm, I'm fortunate to have that level of support where, you know, all, all the kind of like last minute stuff is, um, is taken care of two days in advance. Um, but we, we did have one little hiccup in that we, uh, we have these super nice trainers, uh, and they sent us, or we ordered, I don't know, uh, the wrong adapters for them. Ooh. So, uh, we were getting our trainer set up and they're like, Hey man, um, this isn't going to work. And so we were kind of <laughs> like scrambling around. It's like, uh, 90 degrees in Knoxville. And, uh, we're like running around the, uh, parking lot asking if any of the women's teams who had, had finished up already had extra trainers and they were like nah man like we're out of here and so fortunately there was a road that we could warm up on and it wasn't a big deal um and then so you get your warm-up done and and uh and then you know you you get on start ramp and it's it's you and you know one of the guys who was in my wave was Corey Lockwood who's two-time amateur time trial champion um fantastic competitor, you know, just, just seeing all these dudes who are like, uh, you know, Corey was in this, uh, video series that talked through all of his training and, and things for, for a couple of years. And so, you know, being able to, to kind of, you know, you take the edge off, you know, like by chit chatting with these guys and, and it's just so, it's such a cool experience being there with all these people who are, you know, the best in their, in their state, in their region. Um, and then all of us are, are competing against, world tour guys who are some of the best in the world. So, um, it's, it's nice not being, uh, not being the favorite in those situations, you know, nobody really even knows who you are. Um, so you can just go out and execute your race plan. So, um, you know, I, 
I got pretty close to executing my race plan and uh you know the heat kind of got to me a little bit on the last lap but you know it it just goes back to I think experience um those world tour guys that are there they get probably 20 race days of long technical time trials a year um compounded year over year um that we just really don't get staying in America racing so um, I think experience showed the understanding of how to maintain your position through all of the technical areas of that course showed. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was just awesome to see some of the times that they were posting and, you know, you leave there um, a little disappointed in your own result, but also just in awe of the level um, that's not only like attainable, but it's the level that you have to be if you want a, uh, a result higher than what you got at, at pro nats. So, um, it was cool kind of, um, you know, Lawson Craddock and some of the EF guys and Joey Roscoff were all just in another stratosphere, like a minute up on us. And then there was this group of, uh, really elite amateurs, you know, non world tour guys, um, who were all within 12 seconds of each other. So seventh through 11th was like 17 seconds difference or something like that. Um, so that was cool knowing that, you know, not only, not only are world world tour guys like world tour for a reason, but there is this like a uh, select group of amateurs that are going to be pushing the the bounds, you know, in the, in the coming years. And, and we're all pretty close to each other. So that was, that was cool. Um, well, that's got to make all of you hungry, you know, to, to say, yeah. wow, there's, there, <laughs> it's nice. It's nice for any of us athletes. One, it's cool to be the underdog. Cause there's so much less pressure as an underdog there is uh to go in and perform you still have a high standard for yourself but you know that everyone else is paying attention to these other elite performers and that's good and it's but it's also good to have that carrot mm -hmm. you know to have that carrot out ahead of you that you know they are they're proven better than i am at this point in time for those reasons you, you talked about but one day you can get there and so as you've wrapped that up and you're in the car driving away from the event in the days afterward, I'm sure you replayed that race in your head many times. Looking back, what do you feel like aside from the pacing? Because I know that was a consistent thing I heard from a lot of people who raced that day because I was there, was how amazing they felt on lap one. Mm -hmm. But then when lap three came around, it was a different story. So what are, aside, you know, with the pacing as well, but what are some other things that you look back on and say, okay, I, I've got to get more of this and I've got to improve on this. Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the big ones for me was position maintenance. Um, you know, for, for the amount of work that we've done, we, you know, had a, had a pretty late start this year to getting all the equipment together. Um, so that the like current iteration of the bike, I'd only ridden maybe like five or 10 times. And um, so the position was a little bit new. Um, and as you fatigue, your position gets, worse um if you're not you know accustomed to to what you need to do to fix it or how to maintain it um so not only did the pacing kind of go awry at the end but my position got worse um so you know i think for me it's almost like going back to uh getting more time trial racing days um every year um especially like the 40k distance on somewhat technical courses so um, there's a couple different ways to do that, but, you know, experience, you know, we always go back to that. Like that's, we're, we're still lacking the experience. Um, so yeah, getting, getting some of that stuff dialed in earlier in the year, um, I think would have made a big difference. Um, more race days would have made a big difference. Um, I made the decision not to take an ice sock, <laughs> um, because I thought it would mess up, um, you know, like the kind of airflow of my back is like a big lump of ice, um, and it was much warmer on the day than I thought it would be. Um, so, you know, having ice somewhere uh, to kind of stave off the, the heat wave that you got on lap three um, would have made a difference. Um, you know, and it, it just goes on and on. Like the, I think, you know, if you if you take it on very simple terms, like it was like a minute 30 to Lawson Craddock. So like 30 seconds of that could have been uh, just sheer lactate threshold power that he's got on everybody else. 30 seconds could have been position and 30 seconds pacing, you know, um, and with pacing, you, you go to 
cooling and all those other things that that help you with lot or with uh power production so you know it's 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 you try and keep it simple when you like reason why you got beat so bad but you know there's there's a lot of improvements that can still be made even at my level you know like and and the good thing is like we've got like the best equipment you can buy right like the bike everybody's got a super bike at that level so there's not that much um in bikes anymore you know everybody's got fast tires and wheels and the special carbon bars and every bike is wind tunnel optimized and has been for years and years so like um it kind of puts it on you and your ability to pedal and steer and uh maintain that fast position so yeah there's there's still plenty to work on <laughs> well that that that's going to keep you motivated and hungry to just continue to focus on it uh but then you went from underdog to one of the favorites and yep. i knew it and everyone else knew it uh and so not just a week later you competed at elite nationals different ball game uh what was your mindset going into that after the pro experience, especially after having a very tough road race on Sunday where you did really well uh, and then you're having to then travel, hit the road, the life of a pro cyclist, you hit the road and you've got the time trial ahead of you. So, yeah, what was your mindset and what what was so different about that day that you came home with the W? Yeah, so it like you were like you were saying, there's a lot less pressure when you're the underdog. So um in in florida you know um it was a lot more about executing and like delivering the win um because that was the expectation um which you know it's it's crazy to expect to win anything uh nevertheless a national championship but i mean that was kind of the the way that we were talking you know like um it wasn't um you know I, I, so i was supposed to go with one other teammate who was um basically like one of the fastest 40k times uh ever um who is extremely good on courses like that and then he was unable to make it um at the last minute so it became instead of like one of us has to win it was like you have to win and <laughs> you know like it's um i i mean i i don't know like i i enjoy those situations right because it's not like you don't um you don't go out with this, like, I'm going to ride out of my skin and like do something I've never done before kind of, uh, mentalities in that situation. It's, I'm going to execute my plan because I think this is a winning plan. Um, and so, you know, it, at collegiate time trial nationals, it was the same thing. You know, one of the things that I was, I was thinking to myself during collegiate race was that champions ride their plan. You know, you've done all of this work, you have all this experience behind you, you have the power to win this race. You have all the things that you need. You have to ride your plan. You can't make it up on race day and create some alternate reality where you're going to do 300 watts instead of 200 watts for the distance of this. Um, you have to ride your plan. So um, going down in Florida, it was another hot day. Um, the, the course was uh, seemingly simple, but there was a lot of like sections of bad pavement. There were some railroad tracks, like, um, the wind direction was like pretty dynamic. So there's a lot of things that you have to lean on your experience in order to, to overcome these obstacles, um, to execute. But yeah, I was, I was able to execute and we thought we had a, a pretty good winning margin. And then, uh, Brennan Wirtz, a, uh, a world champion rower comes in two seconds behind me. And uh, our whole like little tent area, you know, it was like me and a bunch of the Velocius junior kids all hanging out, like feeling good about this. And then the whole tent went quiet. <laughs> and we we're like, hopefully he doesn't have a twin brother who's also <laughs> coming through here in a second. Uh, Cause that's insane. So, you know, uh, fortunately, you know, uh, Brendan was second fastest finisher and, and we were all able to celebrate after that. But yeah, it was, it was a very different mindset going into that race. And yeah, the, the feeling of almost relief um, to, to be able to execute and, and you know, do, do what was asked of me um, was, was a better feeling than even, oh my gosh, I just won a national championship. Yeah, well, I'm sure it was a huge relief and it's, it's also validation. It's a, it's a great validating moment for all the work and focus that you've put into this on the bike and also off the bike. 
the things, the sacrifices, the, 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 the studying, the preparation that you have to do to be able to execute on that day, like you said. And you bring up a great point, I think, about mindset when it comes to those moments, because there's sometimes when you go in as a competitor, and I think the important thing to do is remind yourself that I just have to perform at my best today. If I perform at my best today and I've got a good plan, it's going to be a good day. You don't have to be somebody you're not and stretch yourself 10 or 15 or 20 percent. Um, if you're ready and you're capable, then trust yourself and, and go with it. But there may be moments where uh, you do need an extra 5 percent or 10 percent and you're going to have to figure out where that's at. Is it in your actual legs? that you can stretch yourself or is it in your tactics mm -hmm. uh, and your approach and how you execute uh, the plan. Uh, and you need to decide as a performer, as an athlete, uh, with you hopefully with maybe even the help of some coaches and some mentors is uh, reminding you of what is needed for that day. And I think it's cool that you just went into it, you and the team just went into it with that approach. like. No, this is this is good enough. Sometimes just who you are is actually good enough for an amazing performance. And that's a great feeling. Totally. Yeah. And and having the kind of support system that we did this year, um, it was, you know, very like confidence inspiring that uh, like my best was good enough. Right. So we were able to work with uh, the wind tunnel and, you know, all these uh, amazing, amazing companies. Uh, Argon has like the fastest bike in the world and they let us ride them this year. Um, Nodio um, has come on board for some like live action aerodynamic testing. My windsock, um, you know, uh, Pirelli tires were amazing, you know, bombing that descent at 50 miles an hour at Pronats, like um, all these, all these companies. Jack Crew literally made us a new skin suit because we said we didn't like their other one. Um, because it didn't have the aero striping or, or just some different stuff. So they said, all right, guys, like, here's some prototypes, like pick the, pick the one you want the best. We'll wind tunnel test it and we'll have it to you by uh, Pronats, which was like three weeks later. And so it was just like, it was bizarre, you know, like to have that level of commitment and, and things, you know, you feel like you're, you're a, a professional cyclist, you know, like it's, it's pretty crazy. So, um, well, you know what, man, I think too, it, it goes, you know? it goes to the heart of, it's like when you see someone who is all about what they're doing, mm -hmm. like, man, you're so excited. You're all in, you're not pardon my French, but you're not half-assing it. Yeah. You're not half-assing it. No one's going to get behind you and anything you do if you're half-assing it, but if you're going full gas, like you're all about it. It's amazing how other people will then also step up and say, oh, they're serious. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get serious. If they're serious, I'm serious. And what you can accomplish when uh, a group of people uh, and companies come together and say, well, let's do it. Let's go for it. Uh, you know, and it's either we're going to win this thing or, hey, we're just going to do the best we can, but we're not going to half-ass it. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's it's it's like so awesome that you know jack already made the design for the the uh national champion skin suit and you know like they're stoked on it and i get to share that same design with several of the veteran athletes who have won national championships this year like and that's that's one of the things like they made a post about it and we've talked about it on some of our calls and stuff like that makes it so much more like powerful and meaningful and everything because it's not you know individual time trial is is totally about you but wearing, wearing that skin suit and being able to represent, um, you know, the, the organization and, and all the people who were behind that, um, is, is super special and, and really powerful and motivating to, to improve on that. And, you know, like maybe sneak a win in the, in the pro national time trial next year. So, well, the power of story, uh, mm -hmm. it, I tell you, it, it has, it has a gravitational pull on people to go in directions that are healthy and good and inspiring. And you're doing that. <laughs> And you're helping other people do that. And I admire that in you and, and, and in others who are like you. And so, uh, yeah, that's why I started this podcast was to be able to tell stories like that and like this and help other people learn and grow uh, because we can't do this by ourselves. It's just not possible to do awesome, cool things by ourselves. And 
And so I just want to, yeah, again, congratulate you on all this effort. It's just, it's nice when things come together, when you put so much into something and it pays off. And, and I don't think the payoff is done. You know, it's not <laughs> done. Not. <laughs> no, it's not done. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have another discussion perhaps about uh, mindset and, and adjusting and adapting to failures and, mm -hmm. and still dreaming. You still got a dream. You still oh, yeah. got a dream. The dreaming don't, it, it don't stop. It don't ever stop. So yeah, fundamentals of time trialing, ability, mindset, equipment, training, competition races, and experience. Boy, it all came together. Uh, hope you've learned something from this. Uh, and Zach, I really appreciate you sharing all your thoughts because uh, you're outstanding at it. And I know you got a lot of people looking up to you for what you're doing. And I'm excited about your future, man. Uh, and and what, else, what else you can do with it. Appreciate it. All right. All right, everybody. That's it. Thanks for listening. And uh, if there's anyone out there you think could benefit from this, which means everybody, then share it with them. All right. Peace out.